I, I, I made John promise that he would insult me in his introduction, and, and I think he failed, except he called me a theoretical physicist, so I think by, by his standards that <laughs> he succeeded. Um, so thank you for that introduction, and it's great to be here. Uh, I wanted to start off my talk by acknowledging my co-conspirators in this effort. First and foremost is Martin Casado, who's a graduate from here in 2007, should be familiar to all of you. I believe he's a consulting professor, actually, here. And uh, he is really the, the inventor of software-defined networking. He remained the intellectual leader in that field some six or seven years later. And everything I'll be saying today is really largely due to him. Then there's another character you're familiar with who, when he's not starring in James Bond videos, actually has been leading the, the software-defined networking effort as well. And then there's somebody you probably don't know very well, which is Temu Kaponen, who has played a major role in architecting software-defined networking, and in his spare time is the best internet architect in the world, period, by a large margin. So uh, I, I wanted to spend a little time talking about my co-conspirators rather than just putting up their names on the first slide, because when I was at Xerox Park about 20 years ago, they did a survey asking, how do you choose what problems you work on? And most people said, you know, intellectual depth or practical relevance or, you know, potential commercial applications. And I said, I choose who I work with, and then I choose what I work on. And because for me, the idea of co-creating with people that I like and respect is the highest pleasure in research. And so for the work in software-defined networking, I've had the best of both worlds, both intellectually interesting work and working with people that I have the utmost affection and awe of. Now, of course, in software-defined networking, lots of other people have done very important work. There's a huge group at Stanford that's done it, the Open Networking Lab that, that was formed by Guru and uh, that's led by Guru, sort of formed out of the Berkeley and Stanford groups. Then there are people at, at many other universities and many other commercial endeavors who've been working on this. And their ideas obviously will be reflected in my talk, but I want to, you know, most of it flows from these co-conspirators. I want to start my talk with a couple of clarifications. First, I want to acknowledge that coming to Stanford to give a talk about software-defined networking is a huge exercise in bringing coal to Newcastle. And at first I turned down the invitation because I thought, this is stupid. And then I realized that Nick and Guru probably have never given a departmental-wide talk on software-defined networking at Stanford. And I've never given a department-wide talking on SDN at Berkeley, but Guru has. And so maybe the right aphorism here is that nobody can be a prophet in their homeland. And so you have to go to some other university to be able to articulate your vision of what software-defined networking is. Second is this talk has no technical depth, zero. That you're not going to find any interesting algorithms. There's not going to be any new results of we used to not be able to do this and now we can do that. And that's because SDN really is not a technological development in the classical sense. SDN is nothing more than a way of arranging functionality, arranging network functionality. Now you might think that that's an insult, but the internet architecture is nothing more than how you arrange network functionality and that turned out pretty well. So the point is there is nothing clever about the internet architecture. There's no place where you can look at and say, wow, they solved a really hard technical problem there. It's all about wisdom, about getting the right solution, not being clever. So this is going to be an architectural talk, an unabashedly architectural talk. But academi academia and architecture don't always mix so well. There's a user interface expert who, who played a long role at Apple, I believe he's at uh, Northwestern now, who says academics don't get paid I mean, get paid for being clever, not for being right. <laughs> so in this talk, though, I am not going to try and prove to you that I'm clever, because I'm not. I'm going to try and argue that we're right, because we are. Okay? <laughs> so the talk will have three main components. I'm going to give a basic introduction to SDN. I know a lot of you already know a lot about it. but. If you don't understand the basics, the rest of the talk is a waste of time. This is a departmental-wide talk. So I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And my twist on SDN is probably a little different than what you're used to. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we thought when SDN was invented. What were the, the ideas we had in our mind? And then what we think now. And after five years, and then I'm going to explore the opportunities and implications of these changes in thinking and what it means for the future of networking. 
So I'll start with uh, talking about the basic introduction to SDN. And there I want to talk about its roots. Because its roots are deep and broad. It didn't just come out of one isolated piece of work. There have been people who are doing early efforts to try and separate the control plane from the data plane. I'll explain what those are later. But for Ypsilon, people at Cambridge, long time ago. There were commercial efforts to manage wireless networks. Certainly Aruba, later Meraki, have been using centralized methods that look a lot like SDM. There were effort, internal efforts to tame data center networks at Google and Amazon and elsewhere that looked a lot like SDM. And certainly where I got involved, with the Stanford group was in these academic projects to revamp network management, but there were other projects at um, CMU, the 4D project, at and Research, the RCP project. There were all these people who were working not exactly in SDN, but in closely related areas. SDN, most people think that it originated when the Knox network operating system and the OpenFlow specification came out in 2008. And that's sort of when it officially started. But what I wanted to make clear is it came out of a much longer intellectual history of people working on related things. And when you have this broader intellectual movement of people focusing on similar questions, it's driven by some need. And so the question is, what was the thing that was driving all of us to think about these problems? And they are, first of all, that networks are hard to manage. I, I sort of initially put this in past tense on the slides, that networks were hard to manage, but they're still hard to manage. So networks are very hard to manage. It takes sort of an order of magnitude more sysadmin help to administer a single switch than it does to administer a single computational node. So that they're, they're compared to other things we have in computer science, networks are hard to manage. They're very hard to evolve. That is, if you want to introduce function, new functionality into the network, it's much harder in networks than it is in other software systems we're used to. And network design is not driven by formal principles. And the easy way to look at that, if you look at an operating systems course or a distributed systems course or a database course, they're oriented around some fundamental principles of synchronization and mutual exclusion and so forth that, that you build off of that helps people organize the way they think about the field. The way we, and that means sort of all of us who teach networking, it's basically a big bag of protocols. We have no principles. We just teach them a various set of protocols. So those are symptoms of why we started looking. But what's the root cause? Why do we have these problems in networking? And the way to think about that is to go and ask, well, how do we build the systems that work well? What do we do? What makes it work there? And what we do there is we bake, break the problem into tractable pieces. And this was most pithily expressed by Barbara Liskoff in her Turing Award lecture, where she said modularity based on abstraction is the way things get done. That is, that's the one trick we have. If you want to build a system that scales and works, use modularity based on abstraction. So if you're looking for root causes, the answer is simple, which is if you can't manage, if you can't evolve, and you can't understand a system, then chances are you don't have the abstractions right. So if that's true, then what abstractions do we need for networks? Now to answer that, we'd have to realize that networks have two different planes or two different problems, very different problems being solved in networks. One is what we call the data plane, which is a packet arrives at a switch or a router, and I will use switch and router completely interchangeably, has a packet header. The switch or router looks at the packet header, it looks at some forwarding state that's sitting there and figures out, what do I do with that packet? Do I drop it? Do I send it out port 17? Do I send it out port 27? What do I do with that packet? That's the data plane. This happens on nanosecond timescales, and it's completely local. Then there's the control plane. The control plane is how that forwarding state got there. It could get there through distributed algorithms. It could get there through manual configuration. It's much slower timescales. It's tens of milliseconds to days if it's manual configuration. And it's inherently non-local. That is, the information has to come from the outside world. A router by itself can't figure out where it should send a packet. So these are two very different problems. One is local and very fast. One is non-local and not very fast. They're very different problems. They probably have different abstractions. For the data plane, we have a very well-known set of abstractions. That's layering. That if you go and write a network application, you don't write a piece of spaghetti code that goes all the way up from the application down to low-level networking code, you write your application on reliable transport. 
You write your reliable transport on best effort global packet delivery. You write that on best effort local packet delivery. And you write that on local physical transfer of bits. Now this layering is why the internet was so successful. Because you broke the problem into tractable pieces. When you wanted to solve a networking problem, you didn't have to solve everything at once. And it enabled innovation at every layer, independently. That is, if you w had some new, let's say, optical technology that you wanted to use in the network, you just put it in. That's a new way to do local transfer of bits. Everything else in the stack can remain exactly the same. You didn't have to rewrite the entire networking stack. You just do a local change, and everything works. And this has allowed the internet to survive many orders of magnitude change in the speed and the scale and diversity of uses. You know, six or seven orders of magnitude. That's a pretty amazing feat to have the same architecture still work with almost no change. So that's the data plane. And, and we got those abstractions right. We not including me, but, but we as the community got those abstractions right. What about the control plane? Well, today the control plane has no abstractions. There are a wide variety of mechanisms trying to do a wide variety of things. You want to do routing, that is getting packets from here to there. You want to do various kinds of isolation to make sure that packets from here don't get to here. And you want to do various kinds of traffic engineering, trying to spread the load out across the network so you don't have overloaded links. For each one of those tasks, we have a set of mechanisms. And the problem is that there's no modularity. If you want to write a new out routing algorithm, you start from scratch. There aren't these well-known building blocks that you can start with. You start from scratch. And because you're always starting from scratch, you actually have limited functionality. That is, our routing algorithms aren't very good. Our isolation mechanisms aren't very good. And our traffic engineering mechanisms are actually pitiful. So this is a classic case of the mess is because we built mechanism without abstraction. So if you want to know why was SDN developed, it was because we were struggling with a control plane that was built without any abstraction, and it was an embarrassing mess. So what should we, so if that's the diagnosis, what's the cure? What are the abstractions we should be using? So finding good abstractions is all about finding what pieces of functionality you want to reuse. Okay? So let's think about what you would be doing when you want to design a control plane you know, to accomplish some task. What are the components that you would need to do? First, you need to figure out what the network looks like. If you're going to do something like routing, I need to know what the network looks like before I can decide how I can possibly route. So step one, I figure out what the network looks like. Then I figure out how to route on that network. Or if I'm doing isolation, I figure out how to not route to, to make sure that packets don't get from here to there. And then, once I figured that out, I figured out how do I tell the switches what to do, meaning how do I install the forwarding state in them so they do the right thing. Okay? So I start by figuring out what the network looks like. I then figure out how to accomplish my goal. And then I tell the switches to do what I want. Now, which ones of those are reusable? Which ones of these are reusable? So clearly, figuring out what the network looks like, you're going to use that for a wide variety of control tasks. So that's reusable. Figuring out how to do that task on a particular network topology, that's very specific to the task. That's not reusable. But then telling the switches once you've figured out what to do, that's reusable. So those are the two things we're going to reuse. You now, in exactly 14 minutes, know everything you need to know about SDM. <laughs> that is SDM. It is the use of those two control plane abstractions. That's all it is. So I told you, there was no cleverness. So you have the global network view that provides information about the network. The way that's typically implemented is with something we call a network operating system. That's just software running on servers that happen to be placed in the network. The forwarding model is the standard way of telling a switch how to forward. If you've heard of OpenFlow, that's what the role OpenFlow plays. It's basically just a way you can tell a switch if the packet header looks like this, then take this action. Just a, just a standard way of telling it that simple statement. So given those abstractions, 
then SDN is nothing more than layers for the control plane, just like we had layers for the data plane. It's layers for the control plane. We start with a bunch of switches connected by some wires. We then build the network operating system. Remember, this is just software running on servers, but these servers talk to all the switches. They do so using this forwarding model, open flow like They use the information they get from the switches to build this global network view, that is, they know the topology. And then you build a control program on top of that topology. And that control program can be routing, it can be access control, it can be whatever you want. And I call this layers because you have a very clean separation of concerns. The control program has no other job than to express the operator's goals. Like if they want to do connectivity or if they want to do isolation, that's what the control program is concerned with. It's implemented on top of this global network view. The control program doesn't care where that view came from. It doesn't care how you found it out. It just says, you give me the view, I'll figure out what I'm supposed to do. And I'll compute this forwarding state that every switch should have. The network operating system sits there and it says, I will talk to the switches and I will compute the global network view. I'll gather that information. And that when the control plane, I mean the control program tells me, I will convey the configurations down to the switches. I don't understand what the control program is trying to do. I don't need to. I'll just tell the switches. And the switches just follow orders from the network operating system. A very clean separation of concerns and so now you can have independent innovation at every layer. You can build better routers and switches, and as long as they support this interface, they're fine. You can build better network operating systems, and as long as they take orders from the control program, they're fine. And you can change what your control program does, and the other layers can remain intact. So while this is very simple, it is a major change in the paradigm. That is, the control mechanism now is no longer a distributed algorithm like we think of routing algorithms. It merely uses the network operating system API. It is nothing more than a graph algorithm. Given me a graph, I will figure out what I should do. If you want the shortest path, I use Dijkstra. If you want K disjoint paths, you go write some complicated graph algorithm that computes K disjoint graphs. But it's local. It has nothing to do with distribution. So that makes it much easier to manage, evolve, and understand. Those were the three symptoms we identified earlier that networks were bad at. And once you go to this paradigm, they now become much easier. It also ends up with a very clean separation of control and data planes. That is, the data plane is now completely handled in the switch, but the control plane is now running on these servers in the network. So they're completely separated. Whereas today, when you buy a box, it has the control plane and the data plane all jumbled together in a proprietary closed box. This separation allows you to use commodity hardware and third-party software. It also allows you to do much better testing of the network. Because there's this clean separation, you can test the control plane independent of the underlying hardware. And there's been a lot of work at Stanford and at Berkeley at trying to take advantage of this and try and elevate network testing and troubleshooting to a first-class citizen the way it is in the chip industry and other places where they do this testing very well. So this separation makes networking look a lot more like the rest of the industry. But everything I've said so far is based on what we thought five years ago. So now I want to step back and say, given that it's been five years, we got a lot of it right. But we had a couple of areas where we were just flat wrong. And so the rest of the talk, I want to explore what those areas were, why they're important, and what the implications are for the future of networking. But I want to be clear that if you think about SDN as just sort of observing modularity in networking, that part we got right. And all of the additional insights that we have now are about finding new and more advanced kinds of modularity. That is, our search for modularity was right, We've just discovered additional modularity. Whenever you build a system, it sometimes takes you a while to get the modularity right. And it's taken us five years, and we're probably still not right. So let me list a couple of things we used to think. We used to think that the control program would compute the configurations, that is, the forwarding state, for all of the network switches. We thought that switches were relatively homogeneous in role and function. We thought the network was comprised entirely of hardware switches. 
Of course it was. What other kinds of switches are there? And we thought the nat nat network data plane was fairly simple. Because that's been the dogma about the internet, is that it has a very simple data plane. So what we now think is that those are all wrong. Okay? <laughs> so what I want to do is go through each one of these and explain individually where we're wrong and why you should care that we were wrong. So let's go to misconception number one. The control program configures all of the switches. That is, that its job is to go and compute what the forwarding state should be in all the switches. So what is the role of a control program? Control programs are how operators express their network requirements and policies. That is, should everybody be connected? Should these people not be able to talk to these people? That's what the control program is supposed to express. The control program should not be in charge of implementing those requirements. For a simple reason, which is one of the goals of modularity is to push complexity into the reusable portions of the system and keep the things that you have to write on a per application basis very simple. And you want control programs, which are written on sort of a per site or per application basis, you want to keep those as simple as possible and push the complexity into the reusable code. So you don't want your control program responsible for implementing. So let me illustrate that with an example. So here we have a network. We have host A and host B, and then here are a bunch of switches connected by links. And the operator's goal is to prevent A's packets from reaching B. Let's say this is a visitor's laptop in the, the lobby of your corporation, and this is a back-end database that holds all of your company's secrets. And you would like to make sure that packets from A don't get to B. That's a natural requirement. So if you did it with a standard SDN method, what you would say is the control program would then instantiate forwarding entries that says, if you see a packet from A going to B, drop it. And you would have to enter those forwarding entries at enough places in the network so that it was impossible for a packet ever to get from A to B. And the problem is that then the control prog program must respond to topology and routing changes. Let's say I put in a new link from here to here. The control program would have to know, oh, there's a path available. I better put in another forwarding entry that blocks the delivery of packets. So now it becomes hard to write a correct control program because it's got to monitor all changes in topology and routing. It's not impossible, but it's hard. It's way too hard, Th much harder than it should be. So that's where what we call network virtualization comes in. What we do is we introduce a new abstraction and a new SDN layer. The abstraction is a virtual topology. That is, this is purely logical. We use switches that you can configure. So it's a logical switch that you can put flow entries in. And that's how the operator can express the requirements and policies. And then there's a layer that we call the network hypervisor that translates those requirements into the physical switch. So you can think of it as sort of a compiler for virtual topologies that says, if these are your policies, I will then compile them into configurations of low-level hardware, low-level physical switches. So if you go back to this example, this is the global network view. The virtual topology that the operator would use to say, here's my network, it's just one big switch. And I know I have a host A somewhere and I have a host B somewhere. And all I want to tell you is, if you see a packet from A to B, drop it. At that point, the control program is done. It has told the network all of the semantics that are specific to its application. It's now the network hypervisor's job to insert these flow entries. And if the network topology changes, it's the hypervisor's job to follow those topology changes and make sure you have the flow entries. So now we've made it much easier to write the control program, a lot harder to write the compiler, but compilers are always hard to write. That's OK. <laughs> so we take this picture. And what we do is we insert a new layer, this network hypervisor, in the virtual topology. You write your control programs on the virtual topology. And that topology will differ depending on what job you, you have. And then the network hypervisor translates that or compiles that virtual topology into what your physical network looks like based on the global view. And then your network operating system carries that down to the actual physical switches. So virtualization is the killer app for SDM. Consider a multi-tenant data center, Rackspace, Amazon, 
So you have lots of customers who want to move their network to the cloud. And Rackspace and Amazon want to allow their customers to specify their policies of what VMs are allowed to talk to what other VMs in their virtual network. So they allow them to specify a virtual topology that has their policies and requirements. And then the data center's network hypervisor takes all of these, and I mean thousands of them, and compiles them down to low-level configuration so that everybody's <laughs> individual policies are met. This is something that you could not do with today's technology, or before SDN. Sure, you could do it with a few. Having thousands and having them change dynamically, you couldn't do it. And so this is what people are paying money for. This is the killer app. Now, there are long-term implications of network virtualization. One is that in the long run, virtualization may be more important than SDN itself. SDN may be very useful, it certainly is now, for implementing virtualization. But in the long run, it may be virtualization that's actually the thing that adds value. That is, that's what people are actually willing to pay for because it makes it easier for them to manage the network. And SDN is a means to an end rather than an end in and of itself. Meaning, five years from now, somebody may invent some other technology that supports network virtualization that's better or worse than SDN, but what will be important, I think, in the long run is that we have some kind of network virtualization. We can also extend this to much more general abstractions. The idea of virtual topologies just being sort of logical networks that do forwarding, that happens to be the use people are making of it right now. But you can extend this to include much higher level functionalities like authentication and so forth, and actually allow these virtual topologies to express sort of application level semantics of who's allowed to talk to who, and allow the network hypervisor to then enforce those at the network level. That would make it much easier to build these large-scale applications. So that's something that may happen in the longer term. And that network virtualization completely decouples the control program, which expresses the operator's goals, from the physical network. And what that means is that the operators now abstractly express the requirements and the network hypervisor has complete freedom in how it implements those desires. And that's going to be important. So let's go to misconception number two. Switch is a relatively homogeneous enrollment function. And all I mean by that is if this is a network, then when you implement your functionality, you just sort of, you know, you, you sort of put in these flow entries and they're spread throughout the network and you don't treat switches any differently than, than any other um, a priori. So let's explore that. When you think about what happens when you have a host sending a packet through a network, there are three different logical interfaces. First of all, the host is telling the network something, which is, I want this packet delivered to this destination and maybe something about quality of service. That's the host talking to the network. You then, as the packet goes through and hits each router, the packet is telling something to the router. It's saying, this is who I am. You should look at me and figure out what are your forwarding state you want to use to forward me. OK, so the packet is trying to identify itself to the router. And meanwhile, while all these packets are running around, the operator, network operator is trying to control the network. So the operator is trying to tell the network something about traffic engineering or isolation that's a network level concern, an operator level concern. So these are relatively independent interfaces. Okay? So how are they implemented in today's networks? So for current networks, the packet header itself is used for both the host talking to the network and a packet talking to a router or switch. That is, when a packet arrives at any switch, the switch says, first, what was the host trying to do, i.e., what destination was this going to? And then it says, and now I need to use that information to look up in my forwarding state to figure out how to forward the packet. So it's doing both of those interfaces with the same header. But current networks have no general operator network interface. That is, the way the operator controls the network is completely kludgy and not worthy of the name interface. SDN gives you this complete programmatic, beautifully clean way of the operator controlling the network. But it does nothing to separate the host network and the packet router interfaces. That is, you still use the packet header and you look at it at every router or switch along the way. 
Now, MPLS is a technology that the, the non-networking people don't, uh, you know, probably don't know. The only thing you need to know about it, A, it's used widely in, in large networks. And it makes a distinction between the edge and the core of the networks. The edge uses the header as the host network interface. That is, when the packet first hits the first hop switch, the edge router looks at it and says, what was the host trying to do? It then slaps on something we call a label. Think of a label just as a bag of bits. It's only meaningful within the network. It means nothing to the host. So it inserts an MPLS label. And then the core, the interior of the network, doesn't look at the packet header at all. It just looks at that label and says, somebody already interpreted what this host was trying to do. They put this label on it. From now on, I just look at the label, and that's enough for me to know how to forward this packet. So what we should have done five years ago is recognize that MPLS was right. And we should have incorporated it into SDN, meaning we should have edge routers look at the full packet header, insert a label into the packet, and the core switches, which I, I will sometimes call a fabric, um, forward just based on that label. They don't look at the rest of the packet header. That's already been looked at at the edge. This now creates a very clean network modularity. The host network interface is handled completely by the edge. The packet router interface is handled by the label in the core, and SDN handles the operator network interface. So once again, we find more modularity by separating this out. We have very clean separation of concerns, and we do each job once, and we do it right, rather than having it all munched together. Now, let me consider two controversial claims about this edge core split. One is that the core can focus just on packet delivery. That is, operators have a bunch of requirements. And the claim here is that all of them but connectivity, that is just end-to-end -end packet delivery, can be implemented at the edge. That is, if I want to block access control, if I want to do isolation, I can do all of that at the edge. The core must obviously deliver packets. And I will include in terms of packet delivery also multicast and quality of service. But other than that, the edge can do everything else. Now, every time I give this talk to a networking audience, somebody gets this, oh, here's this use that you can't do at the edge, and then they'll give me some crazy scheme that, of course, you can't do at the edge. So I've modified it that the edge can do everything else that people are willing to pay for, OK? And that I still stand by. So this is the SDN equivalent of the end-to-end -end principle. The end-to-end -end principle in networking said you take functionality out of the network, and you put whatever possible, you put it in the end host. And this is just saying you keep the core of the network simple. You take all the functionality you can out of the network core, and you put it, all of the complexity to the edge. Very similar reasoning, and I think it will be as important in SDN networks as the end-to-end -end principle was for the internet. So you end up with a network that looks like this, which is you have these core switches, you have these edge switches, and the core nodes only provide end-to-end -end connectivity. So if I have a packet here, it's job, the, the job of these nodes are just to get the packet from here to there. And that's it. Okay? They don't do anything else. And the edge nodes do all of the other functionality. So the long-term implications of this are, first of all, we've now told the core, you have one job. Just get the packets edge to edge. Don't do anything else. You don't need to understand anything else. And once you've simplified them to that point, they can do a much better job. So one of the things that people complain about in today's networks, it takes a very long time to recover from failures. That if a link goes down, it can take hundreds of milliseconds to recover from that failure. Once the core is not doing anything else, there are recent research results from, from several groups that argue that you can have the core res respond to failures on packet delivery times, nanoseconds, not hundreds of milliseconds. This is actually what you were doing is you were changing the modularity again and pushing connectivity into the data plane. That is, you actually put something in the forwarding ASICs. It's actually a very simple thing that if a packet comes in in the wrong direction, I remove a destination from my forwarding table. That's it. That's all I need. And I can build a, a sort of a forwarding fabric that will never end up not delivering a packet, meaning that when you fail links, it will find a path. If it, the network is physically connected, it will find a path at packet delivery times. So we can do a much better job by changing the modularity once again. 
You also could imagine, once you have this edge core split, why not put the edge all the way to the host? You know, it will require some trusted hardware and software on the host, you know, sort of on, on the, the host network interface card. But we've got the technology for that. So this isn't trivial. This will require, you know, a lot of interesting distributed systems and security issues. But one could imagine actually building networks where they never saw anything but labels. All the labeling was done off in the ho end hosts themselves. Okay, so let's talk about misconception number three. The network is comprised entirely of hardware switches. So on this one, we just got blindsided. We just, I, I mean, duh, we, of course, switches are hardware switches. Well, you know, what, what, well, turns out that software switches are quite common. Um, every hypervisor has a software switch, right? You have a VM here, a VM here, they want to talk to each other. They're connected by a software switch, a V switch that lives in the hypervisor. So you might say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. That's a special case. It's not a special case. There are more software ports than hardware ports right now. If you consider a vSwitch as having software ports to all of its VMs, in 2012, the number of software ports crossed the number of hardware ports. I'm sure I'm violating some copyright agreement by showing this slide, but um, I stole this from somewhere. <laughs> now, so I can forgive us for not knowing about this in 2007. If you extrapolate these curves, then hardware clearly dominated, but not now. Not now. Software ports dominate. So this idea that the network is made out of hardware switches, just not true. Just not true. And not only that, but software switches are getting much faster. Now, I, I just need to clarify. When I say software forwarding, obviously all forwarding is done eventually in hardware. So if you're using an x86, a general purpose processor that doesn't know you're doing software forwarding, I call that software forwarding. If you're using a special purpose ASIC that was designed with networking protocols in mind, that's hardware forwarding. So that's the, the language I'm using. And so a data point that if you use sort of recent Intel technology, you take a single core, it can do 23 and a half million packets per second of IPv4 forwarding. We did this with mid-sized packets, that's 16 and a half gigabits per second for a single core. If you extrapolate of what that would be for average size packets, that's a single core doing 200 gigs. Now clearly a single core can't do 200 gigs. It doesn't have anywhere close to that I.O. But the point is, computationally, the amount of work you need to do to do software forwarding is not very hard at all. So the claim number two, I promised you two controversial claims. The claim number two is the edge can use software. That is, when you have this edge core network, all of the edge switches are software switches. The core switches are still hardware, but the edge switches are software. So you can clearly do this in virtualized data centers because that's what's happening already. They use the, the V switch and the hypervisor. If you look at a large ISP, Verizon, AT&T, Deutsche Telekom, and you look at the total amount of bandwidth that they send interdomain that crosses their borders, and you ask, how much would I have to spend to buy enough cores to do that forwarding? It's $150,000. That's not even the price of a mid-range router. So the amount of forwarding you need to do, software forwarding, is, is trivial. Okay? And so when you look at other examples of enterprise networks and so forth, I don't see any setting where it would be infeasible to do software forwarding at the edge. It may not be as cheap as you can do it today. In most cases, it certainly won't be as cheap as you can do it today. But you certainly can do it. So let me talk a little bit about software versus hardware. Because I'm not claiming that software forwarding is as fast or cost effective as hardware forwarding. You know, people who know better than I tell me there's two orders of magnitude difference and it's probably growing. I'm fine with that. My point is that the edge forwarding requirements can be met with software. And that we would be better off with the increased flexibility of software at the edge. We don't need to use it in the core because we don't need any flexibility in the core. The core is just doing label-based forwarding. Hardware is great for that, but at the edge, we should use software so we're not limited by what current ASICs can do. So the 
I, I hope you will forgive me. I'm now going to tell you about a long-term opportunity this presents. This is one of my sort of academic obsessions. So if you don't like to think about internet architecture, you can turn your brain off for 30 seconds and I'll come back to it. But what this could do if you put the software at the edge is you could allow architectural evolution and diversity. What I mean by that is you build, let's say, AT&T or Deutsche Telekom. They build their domain with software at the edge, hardware internally. Only the software at the edge knows that you're running an interdomain protocol, meaning knows that you're running IP. Everything else internally is protocol agnostic. Think of it as, as you know, layer two ethernets are protocol agnostic. They don't care whether you're running v4 or v6. So now, if you want to change architectures, like going from IP4 to IPv6, that's just changing your, your SDN control program. It says, rather than looking at this bits in your packet header and doing that match, look at these bits in your packet header and do that match. That's it. That's the IPv4 to IPv6 transition. Right there. It's that simple. And then if you want to do something radical, you may have heard about these information-centric networking that say, you know, networks shouldn't be designed around the socket interface about sending packets. It should be this pub-sub interface about getting content. And that's a radical change, and we need to change the entire network. That's just changing your SDN control program. Quite seriously, that's all it takes. Now, you do need to make some modifications on the end host. But in terms of the network infrastructure, it is an update to your SDN control program. Now, you might be saying, but, but how can you change the architecture? The thing we've all been taught in networking class is that the internet works because we have this narrow waist that everybody agrees upon. And that, of course, everybody agrees that you, you, you need a narrow waist. And that, quite simply, is bullshit. We don't need a narrow waist. Um, I, I can explain why the narrow waist comes because we've conflated ethernets with domains, but that's a longer lecture. But domains can run many architectures in parallel. And to support these architectures in parallel and do it on the host, it's conceptually radical. But the technical changes you need to make are embarrassingly simple. So this is easily within our technical range. It's just a question of convincing people it's worthwhile to do. OK, so end of rant. That so let's go on to misconception number four and something that somebody other than me cares about. Um, and here, uh, this is the network data, data plane is fairly simple. And here I am stealing content from Sylvia Ratnasamy, a colleague of mine at Berkeley. And there's a saying about artists that, that good artists borrow and great artists steal. So in this regard, in this regard only, I claim greatness. <laughs> so the myth of the Internet's data plane is that the internet only provides best effort delivery and that that's enough to satisfy users. The reality is that these things called middle boxes or network appliances are used to augment the data plane and they do all sorts of stuff. Okay, so you have firewalls, you have WAN optimizers, you have proxies, you have gateways, you have VPNs, you have load balancers and you have intrusion detection and that's only a partial list. So you have lots of things on the data plane that are doing things. It's not simple. The other thing that's very shocking is that Sylvia's group found that when you go do measurements and you look at small networks, medium networks, large networks, and very large networks, and you count the number of middle boxes, and you compare it to the number of routers and the number of switches, and they're comparable. Middle boxes, you shouldn't think of your network at, oh, it's all switches and routers and there are a few middle boxes over here that I, I can treat in a special case. No, there are as many middle boxes as there are routers. So there are four important facts to remember. One is most packets are touched by several middle boxes. Ah, sorry. Thank you for, for asking that. A middle box is so, oh, so I, I have this beautiful, pristine textbook network. I have switches and routers. Packet gets routed between switches and the routers, and they go. The only time anybody understands a packet is when it's sent from this host and when it's received at that host. That's the mythical internet. And then I'm going to, big bad middle box is going to be stuck in the middle of the data plane. And a packet comes in, and this box, and we call it a middle box, it's stuck in the middle, will then look at the packet and make some decision about that packet, like, I don't like the content of this packet. I'm going to drop it. Or I'm going to look at this packet and see if somebody is attacking me. Or I'm going to be a firewall and I'm going to control connections. And that's why it is data plane in that it is stuck right in the middle. It has no official role in the, the flow going on, but it's making decisions about packets. So thank you for asking that. So that's what a middle box is. 
So now let me get back to the, those four facts. Most packets go through several of them. They're typically deployed at the edge of the network. They typically, not always, but they typically use x86 packet processing. And the things they do to the packet are much more complicated than what you would do if you were just simply forwarding the packet. Okay, so if you accept these four facts, there's one absolutely inescapable conclusion, which is that SDN should implement middle box functionality at the edge in software, replacing all these separate boxes that we have currently doing. You know, we put in these separate boxes being middle boxes, but we ought to be doing it at the edge in software, right? Because it's already being done at the edge in software, just not by SDN. So SDN just should bring it under its domain. And when you do that, you have now cemented the case for edge software forwarding. Because software forwarding was necessary for middle boxes. It's already being used for middle boxes. Doing, I mean, software processing, doing the extra forwarding is a tiny additional. If you have enough cores to do your middle box functionality, you essentially have enough cores to do your software forwarding on top of it. Yeah? What do you mean by the edge? And is there only one edge? <coughs> An edge means any time a packet from a host, an end host, enters the network, that first hop is an edge. So the boundaries between domains and ISPs are not edges? Ah, I, I should say, there are two edges, right. There's when it leaves a host or when it's entering from another trust, trust domain. And so that would be two domains who are connected that don't trust each other. Then you have to consider that an edge because any label that would have been inserted by that domain, I, will, I don't either trust or don't know the meaning of it. It traverses many edges, getting from one place to another? Yes. So, if we buy this, that we're going to do software forwarding at the edge, this represents a radical shift from hardware to software. The hardware network goes back to being dumb pipes. But they were in the beginning when we actually didn't have any middle boxes and actually the network just forwarded packets. And everything interesting happens in software, at the edge, under the control of SDM. This is the truly disruptive nature of SDM. There was, ah, yes. Based on our current understanding of how middle boxes work, do we know if they're processing every packet that flows through them or only t uh, processing a sample of the packets flowing through them? It really depends on the middle box. Because if it's the case that they're only processing a sample of them, then by using software to forward every packet and necessarily process every packet, wouldn't you be introducing a lot more network latency? You wouldn't be introducing more network latency. Uh, the packets that would have been ignored by the middle boxes. Uh, meaning, uh, so if what you're saying is that I'm going to do something very slow on some packets, but what you would say is I need to have enough core capacity so that I can forward that line rate. Yeah. And if I can't do it with one core, I take two cores. And if I can't do it with two, I take seven. Okay. And so if I'm forwarding at line rate, then you don't increase the latency. Yeah. What, what's What's the commercial impact of this observation? This uh, seems to me to be very disruptive to current uh, network hardware manufacturers. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to that at the end, okay? Because I, I, I think that's, that's a subject for uh, uh, prolonged discussion. So well, I want to step back because we've now gotten to this place where we, we've focused on software forwarding. You might say, you know, you said you were coming here to talk about SDN and now you're talking about software forwarding. How do we get from here to there? So let me recapitulate. SDN established this nice control plane modularity. Switches, network operating system, control programs, they all had their own jobs. And then virtualization came in and decoupled the control program from the physical network. So what this did is the control program just expressed its goals on a virtual topology. That gave the SDN platform full control over how it implemented those desires. And then we said, now that the SDN platform has full freedom, it's going to say, let me put the functionality at the edge and just do forwarding in the core. So you removed all but all functionality but connectivity from the core. And then the last step we said, and gee, by the way, at the edge, we can use software there. We, we can forward fast enough to do software there. And that last step 
pulls all the functionality out of any ASIC. There is no longer any complicated functionality in the ASICs. The ASICs are just doing label forwarding, and all the complicated functionality is now at the edge in software. So that's why SDM plays such a role, because it is able to control where the functionality is implemented and manage the network in that way, that you can put it in the one place where you can replace hardware forwarding with software forwarding. Now, you might say, why do I care so much about software? I mean, was I beaten up by an ASIC when I was a child? And, and you know. <laughs> um, and the point is, software forwarding is a stable forwarding platform that does not limit functionality. You know, if I want to match over the first 500 bytes, I can do that. If I want to match over the first 30 bytes, I can do that. It doesn't matter. I'm not told of, well, this ASIC only supports matches up to X bytes. And if you want to do more than that, we just can't do it. Now, obviously, if I want to match over more bytes, that goes slower. But we're used to that in software, that if you ask something to do more, it goes slower. But it doesn't fall off a cliff. And it's a platform that gets faster over time. New functionality is deployed merely through software upgrades. And hardware upgrades are largely transparent. I just I put new hardware, and it goes faster. Yeah? The idea that software only gets faster over time so it can be only a hardware person to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What, what, I, I'm I've sorry. never seen what? software that actually got faster over time. <laughs> <laughs> Without better hardware underneath, and we know Moore's Law has reached the end. So I don't see how that's going to happen. Software gets slower over time. All these guys don't believe in many core. <laughs> <laughs> Power is constrained. I, I, what I would say is <laughs> that, first of all, if you look at the recent forwarding rates, x86 forwarding rates have, have increased dramatically over the last couple of years. So whatever they're doing, they're figuring out, just like virtualization has gotten better. I don't care about Moore's Law, but people are figuring out what instructions we need to do forwarding faster. And that's clearly, you don't see any curve that looks like that's flattened off. Maybe it will in a few years. But we also can spread, you know, forwarding packets is highly parallelizable. Using multi-core for that is, is very easy because we just, you know, we typically are not joining the forwarding of one packet to an... Mm -hmm. well, actually, at this time, I thought you meant it was going to reduce latency. But using multiple cores is not going to reduce latency. Oh, I'm sorry. I understand that you care a lot about latency. I do not. <laughs> what I mean by that is, at the forwarding rate of a single packet, that the latency that, you know, if I can go at 200 gigs computationally, then whether, when, when the capacity, the total, you know, that latency in the switch is not the main thing that I'm worried about in terms of latency. So I care about increasing aggregate bandwidth. I care about, can I have a thousand port 1,000 by 10 port switch. That's what I care about. The actual latency on an individual line is, is, is low enough that I don't think that's, that's the issue. Forwarding? When you do it in software, you gave a number that was throughput, but you didn't give an actual latency number. No, I, I don't have that number off. So I'm curious if, for example, this is assuming that you're doing uh, packet flows that go across the US and take hundreds of milliseconds, so you don't mind wasting a few tens of microseconds on each end doing the, the software business. Yeah, so I, I don't have that number. I don't have that number. So the nice thing about this platform is it provides both stability and innovation. There's a much more stable customer experience than certainly if you try and do a network upgrade. And there's more innovation and competition both in the hardware and the software platforms. And this is much like the x86 computational platform over the past decades. So this is why I say, given the title of my talk, that SDN and networking in general is at the crossroads. That the question is, will networking in SDN be defined by the limitations of ASICs? That is, there are certain things you can and can't do. Or will it embrace the generality of software forwarding? So I'm not claiming the move to software will be trivial or fast. It requires new thinking. You know, how exactly do you want to structure your software? What are the kinds of matches you can do in software that weren't practical in hardware? New products, like how do I get a high port density software switch? Those aren't really available today. And you need new players, people whose role in the marketplace is to fill those niches. Right now, they're not there. But this move is inevitable, and it's already underway. That is, if you look at what's going on 
in middle boxes. You're already paying that latency if that's your concern. All we're saying now is you want to take advantage of the fact that this is already going on to generalize your functionality. It's certainly going on in uh, virtualized data centers. And this transition, and this is getting to the point that was raised before, will change the nature of the networking industry. It's faster innovation, more competition, and better customer experience. And with that, thank you. Yeah. Distributed denial of service attacks probably in this probably right in the future. So what I would say is that any mechanism you would want to deploy that you could deploy more easily by doing it in software at the edge than you could do now by saying, okay, I have to go and find a middle box, I have to go put it in a choke point so that I can do whatever countermeasures I want to take. So it doesn't magically solve it, but it gives you a much easier deployment path for those kinds of solutions. I mean, if you're talking about interdomain solutions, then this doesn't address interdomain. Yes. Yeah, I've been reading that uh, a lot of people are trying to apply SDN to layer four problems like load balancing. <coughs> you know, some hard ones that hardware has done pretty well at, like SSL termination. Uh, that's kind of expensive. Um, you know, and I know I do think these changes are going to occur. But what is your uh, take being much closer to this? on all of that. So, you know, I, I think there are some things that are going to be slower, faster than others, but I think eventually it's all going to be eaten by, you know, generalized software for and, uh, You know, I, I think that there is a lot more to be learned about how you can accelerate various tasks. I mean, the, the one thing that Intel is really good at is if you give it workloads, it will go and sort of exhaustively look at, gee, what instruction would speed this up? And we're at the very early stages of looking at the entire pipeline to figure out what x86 could do to make these things faster. So really quick question on that is, are people in the industry right now using commodity hardware, like just standard rack mount PCs to implement these network operating systems and things like that? Oh, so the network operating system, yeah, that, that's just a, that's not on the data plane. The question is, where are they implementing the data plane? And then, some middle boxes are essentially stock servers that just have a few cards stuck on them. And then I, I, I once was um, on an airplane sitting next to somebody, uh, obviously a salesman, because the only people who talk to me on airplanes, I, I put on this sort of very antisocial demeanor. So <laughs> you can tell, somebody starts talking to me, I know it's a salesman. <laughs> and, um, and this person, you know, I found out, worked for a company that sold security middle boxes. And so I said, you know, use special purpose process, you know, do you, and, and he said, yeah, you know, and then sort of after about a half hour, he said, well, you know, actually our old box used special purpose processor. Our new box uses just x86, but we can't admit that to any of our customers because our whole marketing campaign was based on special purpose hardware. <laughs> but but, but, but that, that they too had sort of decided that the flexibility was such that writing that technology curve was, was the win in the end. What are your thoughts about the power and space constraints when the edge is not a virtual data center, but the edge is a central office as a metro edge or a point of presence and so on, where power and space become, uh, become scarce resources, then when it's software at your, as your edge, where, how do you think it will get realized or when will it get realized because of those constraints making it difficult for people to deploy a software as an edge when it's not a host, but it's really a network coming in as an edge. So, as a so I, I think that's going to be one of those cases where on the one hand you have worse power consumption, and on the other hand you have better flexibility. And different markets will make the transition at very different times. That is that when people recognize that once I move to an x86 platform, I actually have to upgrade my equipment much less often, certainly upgrade my software much less often, um, that it's a better, you know, sort of total cost of ownership. That's going to differ based on, on different scenarios. And, and I, I don't claim to have any special insights about that. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked about hardware ASICs and software x86 processes, but there's a continuum in there. There are these network processes. Uh, do you see any role for these sorts of things? 
or do you think it will just be, you know, x86 everywhere? Um, I don't, I don't want to make a definitive statement on that. I, I think that the people I talk to about middle boxes seem to think that network processors are getting a smaller share of the market than they used to. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to make a definitive statement, but it seems like they, they've had a very hard time finding the sweet spot that's where the program, the flexibility is much better than but the speed is much better than x86's. I think that gap is, is, is narrowing. In terms of the implementation, are these um, like, is this mostly Linux on x86 with a real-time kernel, or is it some other? Uh, you, mean, you mean how you do software yeah. forwarding? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, I mean, the, you know, Intel has this DPDK, which is a, a software forwarding thing that is, is typically what we took our measurements on. But, but the actual, so it's, a, it's just Linux, um, you know, x86. With the real-time kernel, or is it just regular standard? I think it's a regular standard. I don't think it's a real-time kernel. So, with uh, if if networks become much more programmable, essentially and flexible, what kind of effect does that have on sysadmins? Like, what do sysadmins become in that world? Does Amazon just start hiring way more C programmers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's like this. laughs> right, I mean, I, I think there would be sort of two separate, there's the sort of edge-to-edge -edge network delivery, where the network has a very simple task, and there will be network administrators to sort of make sure that happens. And then there will be people who will be sort of more about the sort of the, the SDN sort of auxiliary functionality, and that will be hopefully programmers. Yeah, and I guess like the, the underlying question is, do you, do you um, envision these things being changed? Like, do you envision people actually writing code sort of on live networks, or is it, or would it still be more of a model where like you have some vendor like Cisco or something just writing new boxes at a more rapid pace because they're easier to deploy? So, uh, um, I imagine there will be companies that write software that they will go directly to users and say, this will solve your problem. So. Aside from, let's say, the large ISPs or the large data centers, I don't imagine many end customers will be writing their own control programs, but there will be companies that do. Um, and the house I'm living in happens to be one of those companies. <laughs> bought the house that, that I happen to be living in. So the, the control program, is there, is there a single control program, or is this a large distributed uh, program which uh, shares information with other instances of the same program, or what? Or what? It so, seems so, so, very complicated. Right. So, so that actually, when you're writing a control program, it is a distributed system. But it's a distributed system running over a cluster, not widely distributed over the entire network. So it's not really just a single box. You, you know, do need to, to shard the problem and spread it over several servers. But you get to control that rather than being the, the victim of the topology of the network. Uh, yeah. Going by this um, core edge model, uh, would it mean that there will be m minimal renovation opportunity in the core area because maybe you can reuse the MPLS? Oh, you mean, you mean there, there will be minimal opportunity to do innovation in the core? Yeah. No, so, so actually, no. Um, that, that something like having networks that respond to link failures immediately. That's something we don't do now. They're terrible about that. And I think that's certainly within technological reach. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it would be not in terms of broad-based functionality, but it would in terms of you know, the metrics of how fast you recover from failures and you know, how fast can you support multicast joins and things like that. It would can be you use MDLS? You know, it's already in place today. Yeah, but, 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 but it doesn't recover very well from failures. So you know you, you need to build in that that stuff. Yeah. So a uh, really interesting talk, uh, really provocative because I. Uh, Whenever Bob starts an answer <laughs> question like this, I start getting strange for me because I. The button cover. <laughs> <laughs> I think of everything so differently, but um, I, I still have a lot of questions. I mean, first, but I, one thing about my idea of SDN is kind of different, the idea that SDN is simply making switches programmable and enabling APIs instead of protocols. And I remember somebody, I don't remember who it was, gave this really interesting talk about like the end of protocols and the future of networking. 
but that was kind of good. And, and I wonder, and so this leads me to question your idea of a hypervisor running on top of the operating system, because usually a hypervisor just uh, creates, sort of recreates a hardware interface or sort of duplicates it uh, and, uh, and you know, virtualizes it. And so the question, I, my question for you is, why do you seem to think that the control programs will want to use the same interface talking to your hypervisor as they would use talking to hardware, because it would seem to make a lot more sense to me to have an API that doesn't necessarily resemble a hardware interface at all. Ah, so you're absolutely right. <laughs> Except that right now, if I'm running a network and I want to move it to the cloud, I think in terms of switches and configurations right now. If the cloud said, we've got this great interface, you know, you have to learn a new language and it's got this other policy thing, but you can do whatever you want. I say, no thanks. If you say, you can take the configurations you're using in your current network and move it to the cloud, I'll do it. But you're absolutely right. I would hope 10 years from now, if we're still using that interface, I would be very disappointed. But right now, it's, this is what people understand about how to think about networks. And um, you know, in the early days of Nasira, I, you know, when we went out and talked to people, we would say, you can do all this great stuff. And their answers were in terms of ACLs and these low-level mechanisms. They could not articulate a policy. It was and so giving them an interface that they understand is the first step. But I absolutely agree. That was what I was trying to say by more general abstractions. I would hope that the virtualization layer supported much more general abstractions in the future that didn't force people into thinking about it the way networks work right now. And if you look at the operating systems, what they do is they don't just virtualize the hardware. They actually provide convenient higher level abstractions like you know, files rather than a virtual disk, or processes rather than you know virtual addresses. But I mean, sometimes they're virtualized. But often you get these sort of higher level abstractions, which are much more convenient. We're, we're in complete agreement. We're in complete agreement. <laughs> what do Beckelstein and the new smaller network startups have to say about this? Uh, I'm, I'm Andy Beckelstein. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. Um, so. I, I mean, what does Arista think about this? I, I, I would not want to. Or then as the next startup. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think the right way to think about this is this is disruptive. It will create new opportunities and it will render some old paths less relevant. I mean, building sort of very fast fabrics is a really important thing. And doing that well is, is incredibly important. So, so I don't want to diminish that at all. So there's going to be a role for hardware here. And, and just it's sort of the allocation of functionality may be a little bit different. Or you know, I would be advocating a different one. But it's not like you know, whole vast swaths of the market go away. So can we expect that the core routers are going to be uh, specialized hardware, or that they're going to be just another instance of a sort of standard server that you buy off the shelf? Oh, no, I, I assume core hardware will be specialized yeah. for okay. boxes. That's because of the multiplicity of network ports. Uh, I was just uh, curious uh, if I understood you correctly. Can you realize a CCN-like model or architecture using the controller? What are the modifications? The, the, because the controller can tell the edge software what to do. So the, the, the controller can say, you know, when, when you look at the packet, look at the, if, it, if this is using some kind of name-based networking architecture, look at the name and the content, go check your cache. If it's there, the action you take is to respond with the object. If not, you forward it the way NDN would. You know, so it's just saying that, that I, you know, that's something that the software can do. Why don't we take one more and then... Yeah. So in the core, do you still feel that SDN and a controller should manage those, even if they have, like, diminished functionality or it's simpler? Because a good chunk of SDN is about manageability, and they're not going to manage themselves necessarily. Yeah, yeah, no, so I, I would imagine the core is still managed by SDN. Sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so I said one more, but let's call it two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with Confuse, with with uh, middle boxes coming, bringing all the functionality at the edge. So the flow table is, brings this very natural uh, decoupling between the fast data plane and then the longer time scale control plane. But the moment you bring the middle boxes there where you have per packet processing, this seems to be uh, a bit mixed up again. Uh, so, will, do you do you think of any abstractions on the middle box that could go down to per packet processing 
that could be similarly abstracted to an SDN controller. I'm not sure I understand. So, I mean, do I think that there are abstractions that, are con that, ed that middle boxes could export to a controller so that the controller could understand what they were trying to do? Uh, um, yeah, so, so what I'm saying is that right now... We have in SDN, we have the flow table. Yeah. And this gives this decoupling of a very fast data plane and a, a much slower control yeah. plane. The moment you bring middle boxes and per packet processing into this picture, right, which sits in the data plane, it's not clear to me how the separation of control plane and data plane happens. Right. So, but, but I, the, the part of your question I would object to is we didn't bring middle boxes into this picture. They are part of the picture, and we're just we're just dealing with it. Um, so, so that they would be part of what we manage, but but it wasn't my idea to bring them there. That's, that's just part of it. <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much. Them, then chances are you don't have the abstractions right. So if that's true, then what abstractions do we need for networks? Now to answer that, we would have to realize that networks have two different planes, or two different problems, very different problems being solved in networks. One is what we call the data plane, which is a packet arrives at a switch or a router, and I will use switch and router completely interchangeably, has a packet header. The switcher router looks at the packet header, it looks at some forwarding state that's sitting there and figures out, what do I do with that packet? Do I drop it? Do I send it out port 17? Do I send it out port 27? What do I do with that packet? That's the data plane. This happens on nanosecond time scales, and it's completely local. Then there's the control plane. The control plane is how that forwarding state got there. It could get there through distributed algorithms. It could get there through manual configuration. It's much slower time scales. It's tens of milliseconds to days if it's manual configuration. And it's inherently non-local. That is, the information has to come from the outside world. A router by itself can't figure out where it should send a packet. So these are two very different problems. One is local and very fast. One is non-local and not very fast. They're very different problems. They probably have different abstractions. For the data plane, we have a very well-known set of abstractions. That's layering. That if you go and write a network application, you don't write a piece of spaghetti code that goes all the way up from the application down to the low-level networking code. You write your application on reliable transport. You write your reliable transport on best effort global packet delivery. You write that on best effort local packet delivery. And you write that on local physical transfer of bits. Now this layering is why the internet was so successful. Because you broke the problem into tractable pieces. When you wanted to solve a networking problem, you didn't have to solve everything at once. And it enabled innovation at every layer, independently. That is, if you w had some new, let's say, optical technology that you wanted to use in the network, you just put it in. That's a new way to do local transfer of bits. Everything else in the stack can remain exactly the same. You didn't have to rewrite the entire networking stack. You just do a local change, and everything works. And this has allowed the internet to survive many orders of magnitude change in the speed and the scale and diversity of uses. You know, six or seven orders of magnitude. That's a pretty amazing feat to have the same architecture still work with almost no change. So that's the data plane. And, and we got those abstractions right. We, not including me, but, but we as the community, got those abstractions right. What about the control plane? Well, today, the control plane has no abstractions. There are a wide variety of mechanisms trying to do a wide variety of things. You want to do routing, that is getting packets from here to there. You want to do various kinds of isolation to make sure that packets from here don't get to here. And you want to do various kinds of traffic engineering, trying to spread the load out across the network so you don't have overloaded links. For each one of those tasks, we have a set of mechanisms. And the problem is that there's no modularity. If you want to write a new out routing algorithm, you start from scratch. There aren't these well-known building blocks that you can start with. You start from scratch. And because you're always starting from scratch, you actually have limited functionality. That is, our routing algorithms aren't very good. Our isolation mechanisms aren't very good. And our traffic engineering mechanisms are actually pitiful. So 
This is a classic case of the mess is because we built mechanism without abstraction. So if you want to know why was SDN developed, it was because we were struggling with a control plane that was built without any abstraction and it was an embarrassing mess. So what should we, so if that's the diagnosis, what's the cure? What are the abstractions we should be using? So finding good abstractions is all about finding what pieces of functionality you want to reuse. Okay? So let's think about what you would be doing when you want to design a control plane you know, to accomplish some task. What are the components that you would need to do? First, you need to figure out what the network looks like. If you're going to do something like routing, I need to know what the network looks like before I can decide how I can possibly route. So step one, I figure out what the network looks like. Then I figure out how to route on that network. Or if I'm doing isolation, I figure out how to not route to, to make sure that packets don't get from here to there. And then, once I figured that out, I figured out how do I tell the switches what to do? Meaning, how do I install the forwarding state in them so they do the right thing? Okay. So I start by figuring out what the network looks like. I then figure out how to accomplish my goal. And then I tell the switches to do what I want. Now, which ones of those are reusable? Which ones of these are reusable? So clearly, figuring out what the network looks like, you're going to use that for a wide variety of control tasks. So that's reusable. Figuring out how to do that task on a particular network topology, that's very specific to the task. That's not reusable. But then telling the switches once you've figured out what to do, that's reusable. So those are the two things we're going to like SDM. There were effort, internal efforts to tame data center networks at Google and Amazon and elsewhere that looked a lot like SDN. And certainly where I got involved with the Stanford group was in these academic projects to revamp network management. But there were other projects at um, CMU, the 4D project, at and Research, the RCP project. There were all these people who were working not exactly in SDN, but in closely related areas. SDN, most people think that it originated when the Knox network operating system and the OpenFlow specification came out in 2008, and that's sort of when it officially started. But what I wanted to make clear is it came out of a much longer intellectual history of people working on related things. And when you have this broader intellectual movement of people focusing on similar questions, it's driven by some need. And so the question is, what was the thing that was driving all of us to think about these problems? And they are, first of all, that networks are hard to manage. I, I sort of initially put this in past tense on the slides, that networks were hard to manage, but they're still hard to manage. So networks are very hard to manage. It takes sort of an order of magnitude more sysadmin help to administer a single switch than it does to administer a single computational node. So that they're, they're compared to other things we have in computer science, networks are hard to manage. They're very hard to evolve. That is, if you want to introduce function, new functionality into the network, it's much harder in networks than it is in other software systems we're used to. And network design is not driven by formal principles. And the easy way to look at that, if you look at an operating systems course or a distributed systems course or a database course, they're oriented around some fundamental principles of synchronization and mutual exclusion and so forth that, that you build off of that helps people organize the way they think about the field. The way we, and that means sort of all of us who teach networking, it's basically a big bag of protocols. We have no principles. We just teach them a various set of protocols. So those are symptoms of why we started looking. But what's the root cause? Why do we have these problems in networking? And the way to think about that is to go and ask, well, how do we build the systems that work well? What do we do? What makes it work there? And what we do there is we bake, break the problem into tractable pieces. And this was most pithily expressed by Barbara Liskoff in her Turing Award lecture, where she said modularity based on abstraction is the way things get done. That is, that's the one trick we have. If you want to build a system that scales and works, use modularity based on abstraction. So if you're looking for root causes, the answer is simple, which is if you can't manage, if you can't evolve, and you can't understand a system,
I, I made John promise that he would insult me in his introduction, and, and I think he failed, except he called me a theoretical physicist, so I think by, by his standards <laughs> that, that he succeeded. Um, so thank you for that introduction, and it's great to be here. Uh, I wanted to start off my talk by acknowledging my co-conspirators in this effort. First and foremost is Martin Casado, who's a graduate from here in 2007, should be familiar to all of you. I believe he's a consulting professor, actually, here. And uh, he is really the, the inventor of software-defined networking. He remains the intellectual leader in that field some six or seven years later. And everything I'll be saying today is really largely due to him. Then there's another character you're familiar with, who, when he's not starring in James Bond videos, actually has been leading the, the software-defined networking effort as well. And then there's somebody you probably don't know very well, which is Temu Kaponen, who has played a major role in architecting software-defined networking, and in his spare time is the best internet architect in the world, period, by a large margin. So uh, I, I wanted to spend a little time talking about my co-conspirators rather than just putting up their names on the first slide, because when I was at Xerox Park about 20 years ago, they did a survey asking, how do you choose what problems you work on? And most people said, you know, intellectual depth or practical relevance or, you know, potential commercial applications. And I said, I choose who I work with and then I choose what I work on. And because for me, the idea of co-creating with people that I like and respect is the highest pleasure in research. And so for the work in software-defined networking, I've had the best of both worlds, both intellectually interesting work and working with people that I have the utmost affection and awe of. Now, of course, in software-defined networking, lots of other people have done very important work. There's a huge group at Stanford that's done it, the Open Networking Lab that, that was formed by Guru and uh, that's led by Guru, sort of formed out of the Berkeley and Stanford groups. Then there are people at, at many other universities and many other commercial endeavors who've been working on this. And their ideas obviously will be reflected in my talk, but I want to, you know, most of it flows from these co-conspirators. I want to start my talk with a couple of clarifications. First, I want to acknowledge that coming to Stanford to give a talk about software-defined networking is a huge exercise in bringing coal to Newcastle. And at first I turned down the invitation because I thought, this is stupid. And then I realized that Nick and Guru probably have never given a departmental-wide talk in software-defined networking at Stanford. And I've never given a department-wide talking on SDN at Berkeley, but Guru has. And so maybe the right aphorism here is that nobody can be a prophet in their homeland. And so you have to go to some other university to be able to articulate your vision of what software-defined networking is. Second is this talk has no technical depth, zero. That you're not going to find any interesting algorithms. There's not going to be any new results of we used to not be able to do this and now we can do that. And that's because SDN really is not a technological development in the classical sense. SDN is nothing more than a way of arranging functionality, arranging network functionality. Now you might think that that's an insult, but the internet architecture is nothing more than how you arrange network functionality and that turned out pretty well. So the point is there is nothing clever about the internet architecture. There's no place where you can look at and say, wow, they solved a really hard technical problem there. It's all about wisdom, about getting the right solution, not being clever. So this is going to be an architectural talk, an unabashedly architectural talk. But academia, academia and architecture don't always mix so well. There's a user interface expert who, who played a long role at Apple, I believe he's at uh, Northwestern now, who says academics don't get paid I mean, get paid for being clever, not for being right. <laughs> so in this talk, though, I am not going to try and prove to you that I'm clever, because I'm not. I'm going to try and argue that we're right, because we are. Okay? <laughs> so the talk will have three main components. I'm going to give a basic introduction to SDN. I know a lot of you already know a lot about it. but. If you don't understand the basics, the rest of the talk is a waste of time. This is a departmental-wide talk, so I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And my twist on SDN is probably a little different than what you're used to. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we thought when SDN was invented. What were the, the ideas we had in our mind? And then what we think now, and after five years. And then I'm going to explore the opportunities and implications of these changes in thinking and what it means for the future of networking. 
So I'll start with uh, talking about the basic introduction to SDN. And there I want us to talk about its roots. Because its roots are deep and broad. It didn't just come out of one isolated piece of work. There have been people who are doing early efforts to try and separate the control plane from the data plane. I'll explain what those are later. But for Ypsilon, people at Cambridge, long time ago. There were commercial efforts to manage wireless networks. Certainly Aruba, later Meraki, have been using centralized methods that look a lot like